I'm a veteran of the open source versus uh, proprietary software wars. I'm also the CEO of a very successful open source company in the UK. I've been, kind of my thing has been driving open source adoption for about 20 years. And I've got to tell you straight away, it's all over. We won. So about driving open source adoption, it's not necessary anymore. That's one of the key takeaways that I want you to know. We won the argument, we won it philosophically, we won it technically, we won it on, in every available way. It is mainstream. So what I'm going to do today, if it's okay with you, if it's not tough, but what I'm going to do, <laughs> do today is that I'm going to share from my personal experience of, of 20 years, and specifically my experience of uh, running an open source business, um, and really some, hopefully, insights in what to do and what not to do. I've made all the mistakes available, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those. If there is some uh, overlap with uh, Mark's talk earlier, then, then that is because some of the, this stuff has slipped through, and because it's real, the kind of stuff that he's saying. So that's what I'm going to do. OK, um, so <sighs> about the advocacy and, and just a couple of things. I said 20 years. I, I formed something called the Open Source Consortium back in 2004. I'm no longer with it. I was with it for a period of time. It, it still goes on, and it was all about advocating to the UK government. Um, we kind of brought the issue front and central to that. After I left the, the OSC, I did a lot of uh, private consulting, and I actually did a lot of work with uh, some people, a chap called Rowan Silver, who at the time was the economic advisor to a chap called George Osborne, who later became the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I did a lot of work with a guy called Liam Maxwell and a bunch of other people around there, and really helped them to understand open source, open standards, and had quite a bit to do with what became the government policy on the area, on, on the issue. So I've had a lot of frontline experience. And when I say we won, honestly, we won. So I'm not going to talk about that. Um, in terms of business, I, I want to tell you a few of the things that I do. And that's not because I'm clever and, and all that kind of stuff, but I am. Uh, and not because my <laughs> company's successful, but it is. But simply because I, I promised in the introduction that I was going to talk about the kind of open source businesses are at, that are out there and the kind of things that people are interested in at the market and the kind of scale that people are, are doing things at now as well. Now, I have to reveal some of my biases up front. My company, we're not a, a company that generates code. Actually, we are, but we generate it accidentally as a byproduct of doing business and we contribute just freely to a bunch of projects. So it's a bunch of projects that our code ha has ended up in, but that's not we're, what we're about. We're not that kind of company. I'm not knocking that kind of company. I think they're great. They're sort of my sequels and all of that of the world. Fantastic business model. That isn't ours. Our business model is very, very broad-based, uh, and it's uh, basically we came to the conclusion, uh, which I am strongly going to advocate to you later on, uh, that open source, however you do it, is a services-based business. And I'll come back to that later. So that's what my company does. I'll give you some specific examples so that you can pick it up a bit as well. Also, we don't do hyper-clever stuff like the Internet of Things and, and the cutting-edge stuff. We're right in the middle of the market and the kind of things that people are actually adopting and what they're actually using on a large scale in, in open source in various different areas. We work in the private sector and we work in the public sector, both central government and local government. And the first thing I want to tell you about in the private sector is it was my assumption many, many years ago that, that open source was a, a small play and that it was for small companies and they were the kind of people who were likely to adopt it. It's not true. The, the biggest companies in the world are adopting it. And in your own businesses, I strongly encourage you to think big because it's just as easy to service a large client. Um, it's crazy, <laughs> Martin, I'll take away. In here, it's just as easy to service a large client as a small one. In, in fact, it's often easier. Many, many years ago, we did a bunch of stuff in the schools business. And I, I'm, I'm not knocking schools, I think they're fantastic, but they were so much hassle working with. They have so many demands, a small sized organization. It's just the same level of demand in a large business. Yeah? Um, so, to give you a few examples, in just the last year, what I'm trying to get across to you is that the open source market now is easy. We did win the argument, and honestly, people out there are flooding to it of all sizes. And 
you just need to be in a certain way and, and interact with them in a certain way and you will get the business uh, at whatever scale. I, I started off my company 20 years ago, 18 years ago, with a tenor and, and, and on a desk. I'm nothing special. I built a company entirely from scratch, organically, and y you can do the same thing. Yep, so I, I didn't start off with billions of pounds in backing or anything. Um, in the last year, we've been working with companies such as RS Components, um, which was I was excited when I got the phone call from them because I spent so much of my pocket money when I was a kid on their catalogues. I've got several people nodding their heads in the audience, right? You know what I mean. I mean, even if we work for them, with them for 10 years, it might make back what I spent with them over the <laughs> my teenage years. Um, but, but these guys, huge company, they're not just UK, they're inter international all over the world, absolutely massive. Uh, and they have rebuilt their entire e-commerce platform on open source software, uh, and they were looking for somebody to both help them with the development of, of that and, and to support it. My company is primarily a support organization now. We went from consultancy into support. We still build projects, we still do support and stuff, uh, that kind of stuff, but we're all about 24-7 support. And they were looking for somebody who could do that. Um, Fantastic, that has developed onto multiple other things as well. They've got really into configuration management uh, and they've just commissioned us to do a project to puppetize their entire infrastructure uh, and to build puppet manifest to, to deploy all of their, not just in their e-commerce stack, but uh, across the whole board. Uh, and anyone not into configuration management get into it, it's fantastic. Huge business in there, enough on that. A uh, couple of exa other examples, we do a bunch of stuff for Gatwick Airport. If you've ever gone through the airport there, all of the screens in there, it's powered by open source software in the background and squared and all sorts of other different bits, uh, pushing out, n not the flight information, but the other ones that push out all the adverts and all of the, all, all the updates and all, of the, all the stuff that they do. Um, giving you some examples of the range of different things that are out there. Um, we've done a hell of a lot of work for uh, a company called Ultramap, which have been taken out of, they were part of, when we came across them, BAE, huge defense company. And essentially what they do is they build a, a, a custom application which tracks in real time shipping around the globe based on all the information feeds. This stuff goes into an open source database and it's got an open source presentation stack and the whole lot and they sell this information out to interested parties who want to know where ships are at any particular moment in time. Um, somebody mentioned earlier today, Seema Whole Foods. We've done a bunch of stuff with them over the years. Their entire infrastructure, the whole lot, is open source. They've still got proprietary desktops, but everything they do in the background, all the network services, all of the email, all of the file and print, all of the directory services, all open source software enough on the, the companies. Um, in the public sector arena, both in um, the, the real big thing in government circles at the moment, especially in UK government, is the whole digital agenda. And they're all, they're all into their digital. What that means is websites with services attached to them. So a few examples of this. We run uh, and manage food.gov for the Food Standards Agency, not just the front end, which has been transitioned into TruePal from proprietary content management, but all the back-end systems that feed that. Th they're a huge document repository. There are tens of thousands of documents presented through the sites. There's a bunch of applications in finding local um, f places that do food and their rating and, and all kinds of stuff. And it's all powered from open source databases, lots of Postgres in there, lots of Elasticsearch, Apache Solar for doing the enterprise search. Uh, again, huge market in enterprise search in the government space. Um, I want to move on because I've already taken enough time on this. And just a, a final example, I hear, still hear, on the advocacy front, that, OK, yeah, we've got into the government, but you can't get into the NHS. They're really resistant to open source nonsense. We've been working off for several years on a multi-million pound project in the NHS, which gets launched in a couple of weeks' time, so listen out for it. Um, multiple NHS trusts aggregating clinical data, decades worth of clinical data, into an open source big data backend and using open source analytic tools, it's, it's a, a researcher based tool, to look for patterns. Big data, fascinating, people have been applying it for years, applying it to shopping, right? Retailers applying it to shopping uh, and they know about your purchase patterns before you do. 
because they've got all of this aggregated data and they've searched it for patterns. Imagine applying that to some more life-affirming things. It's happening. So what I'm saying is I'm not, you know, I don't, don't claim to have a, a, a hotline to her upstairs, you know, and neither am I the guy in the local pub, you know, the, the guy knows everything about everything and, oh, we can solve immigration by doing this and all that kind of stuff. But I do have some experience in this area and I want to share some thoughts uh, and some tips on procurement. See, my fundamental uh, premise is that in this market for open source where we have won, the only way that you can mess up is by being weird. Honestly, if you apply <laughs> some basic common sense and some basic business principles, which have been understood for decades, you will be successful in it. So I, I'm going to a few things out there, and I, I noted these down earlier because Mark stole all my best points, as I've said. I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. You did allude to this one. Number one, stay away from politics and philosophy. Okay. Now, I, I'm not... When I tell you this stuff, I'm also talking to me because I love politics and I love philosophy. I absolutely adore it. Uh, and as open source people, we kind of thrown that way. We are deep thinkers. We have thought about social issues. We have thought about philosophical issues. And it's kind of natural water for us to swim in. But business people hate it. Honestly, they hate it. Except when they don't. A few of them do. But my recommendation is you have that conversation out, out, out in the, down the pub. But for the most part, stay away. People will think that you're boring, weird, unprofessional, something like that, and that's if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, they will simply stop talking to you, uh, and you'll be wondering, well, 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 what happened to this sale? Remember, I'm talking to me as well as you, so some of my points might sound a bit confrontational, but I, I do all of the stuff. I spent decades talking politics and philosophy, Mark knows. Um, Nobody likes a smart ass. Nobody likes somebody con condescending and doing the morally superior thing, you know. Um, when you think about religious conversations and religious converts, that is, I'm sorry guys, but that is how we can come across on that front. So, so don't do it. Don't do it. A um, couple of stories on myself to say I'm not just telling you off, it, it, it's, it's me on this one. But uh, back in the day w when I founded the OSC, and this is ancient history, right? We did a very, very successful campaign um, against the BBC's iPlayer. It, it was one of our first high-profile com campaigns. Uh, and we beat the hell out of these guys and the proprietary nature of it. And the BBC Trust took us up on it, and they said the BBC are really naughty and they've got to do an open source version and all of this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> but while this was going on, in my day job, in my company, Sirius, I got invited in by uh, an outsourcing sourcing company to see if we could help out with, with some projects they were doing. And so I got there and I sat down at the table and all that kind of stuff. And I said, so what's this about? We've done the NDA. They said, well, we're running a bunch of infrastructure for the BBC and they want to use a load of open source in that. And we wanted to talk to you about it. And it's like, I'm sorry, I've got to go. And I, I literally had to stand up from the meeting and walk out because of the conflict of interest, right? On the flip side, and a positive story of where it's worked, the project I told you about in the NHS, uh, the data project, we've been working with them for years, about four or five years. When we first got in contact, there was a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of open source in there. They used it for the front of the presentation stack, so they had Apache and a, a Java application server for actually serving. All, all the interesting stuff, all the databases and all the enterprise search was done in proprietary software not naming any of it, and rather than doing the moralizing and the politics and the, oh, you shouldn't use proprietary and all that kind of stuff, um, we just went with it and said, yeah, it's quite fine, it's, it's absolutely fine. And we spoke about looking after the open source stack, and we spent the time over a period of years to gently educate them without making them wrong and moralizing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and they finally got to the point, and I know it's a patience game, you were mentioning persistence as well, but we won. The whole stack is now open source. All the proprietary is gone. It's worth it. It's really, really worth it. I think we've done enough of that one. <coughs> jargon. Keep jargon amongst yourself. Plain English for customers. Again, Mark made this point as well. It, it, it's, 
it's a waste of time, uh, and it, it's, all, it's all ego, yeah? So yes, we're a specialist, and we're in a specialist area, uh, and it makes us feel better if we're using Jogger, and, and look how clever I am, and all that kind of stuff. Customers hate it. They absolutely hate it. They don't like feeling stupid, okay? They really don't, and it's very easy by using a lot of jargon to intimidate people and, and make them feel stupid in this way. Yeah, nodding heads here. Um, I was the worst at this stuff. I did it all the time and I encouraged it in my company as well, wh which is an absolutely huge mistake. And I can't tell you the amount of customers that, that we lost on it. We used to work for very, very large opticians. Okay, we used to work for spec savers. Uh, and my guys... <laughs> would talk down to them, and they would talk down to the engineers in there, and, and they would <laughs> and sorry to swear, but we actually, they generated um, the notion, and, and I bought into it as well, oh, they're fucktards, and stupid things like that. And this is customers we're talking about, right? Uh, and it, they pick up on it, and they did pick up on it, so guess what, they didn't re renew with us. Well, big surprise there, really big surprise there. Um, on the other hand, okay, so think about this. They don't like feel it, feeling stupid. Flip it on its head, and rather than showing people how clever we are with the jargon, and I understand all the levels of the TCP IP state, or whatever the hell it is, how about making them feel smart by simplifying and translating? Make them feel smart by them quickly understanding what experts need gobbledygook to understand. I saw this in so many times, so I've done it recently, we do a hell of a lot of work with the Je Je Greater London Authority, and we were doing a customer review a few weeks ago with them, uh, on some of the stuff we look after them, and they just, one of the guys in there mentioned that they were looking into identity management, and he said, I, I don't understand it. I said, have you got a little while? We went off to a room, and I explained it in very, very, very plain English to him. Sure, it was simplifying the co concepts, but it was real, and they got it. And guess what? Guess who they want to move ahead with, doing the consultancy with, and doing the implementation with? It's not rocket science, guys. The reason, but my biggest political success was after I left the OSC. And I got a phone call a few weeks after I'd resigned and stood down, and it was a chap called Rowan Silver, and I didn't know who the hell he was at the time, but he said, you know, I'm an economics advisor to George Osborne, and we want to talk to you about open source. And I said, I'm not interested, I don't do that anymore. You guys aren't serious. Yeah, and he said, well, actually, we are. And I spent a long, long time with them not using jargon and, and simplifying in very, very plain English and translating into terms that they were interested in. Yeah, so how much is this going to save off of GDP? How much can we cost the bill and all that kind of stuff? And I'm not going to do this point to death, but you get it. With great respect, yeah, explaining the difference between the GPL and BSD gets you shown the door fast, <laughs> right? Except when they ask. Well, I think you made the point anyway. I love that stuff. I, I love, you know, I, I love all of that stuff. Um, and I do get involved in those conversations. But if it's your opener, they will kick you out. Right? And we've got nodding heads from the experts here. I'll qualify that. Sometimes, and Mark alluded it to, uh, to it earlier as well, sometimes it comes up in the procurement, or sometimes it comes up with people, you know, what about the legal issues on uh, all that kind of stuff. And I tell you, the simplest thing to do is say, hey, look, it's really not a problem. I will introduce you to the experts. Phone this guy. Phone Simon Phipps from the OSI, phone one of them, and get them in. They would love to go into the organisation and explain the difference between the GPL and BSD and do all the consultancy with them. And you look like a hero. You've just introduced them to the world's leading experts on this stuff. And you'd love that phone call, wouldn't you? Right? Simon Phipps at the OSI would love that phone call. Hey, we're working with a client and they want to know a little bit about the open source licences. Would you be interested? Simon says, yeah. Right? And you look like a world expert. But don't lead with that. Okay, I'm very guilty of this. In fact, I've been doing this in here. Don't refight battles that are long over. Because <laughs> right? you just look insecure. Nobody cares that Steve Barmer used to call Linux cancer or an anti American and all that kind of stuff. Some of the younger guys probably don't remember this, so, you know, veteran of the open source. I care. I was there, right? But nobody wants to hear about it anymore, unless they do, and it's, it's a story over lunch. 
um, I was chatting with Mark about a, a very dear friend, and, <laughs> and DJ, about a very dear friend of mine, actually works for me, I'm not going to name his name, but he constantly rehashes all of the, the past open source wars and all, all of that kind of stuff, and, you know, you wouldn't invite him to a party, let's put it that way. <laughs> what customers really want? Well, I'll tell you, it's not about the philosophy and all that kind of stuff. Customers are fascinated by running their business. They just want to run their business. They just want to do the job of their business. That's it. They do want to cut the cost. They do want to do it efficiently. They want to work with people. They don't need to like the person, but they, need to work, they want to work with people who are compatible with that, who can give them good advice, who can listen to what it is that they want and not push their own agenda on them, and who, who can help them to achieve that. Yeah? That's what businesses want. They don't care about philosophy. Um, I told you the Specsaver story. Scared of my engineers, felt looked down on, we lost the account. We did a bunch of work for Bristol City Council um, and a bunch of you will, rec will remember that Bristol were famous for being the first people to implement open office in their organisation, 5,000 desktops. We were the guys who told them not to. Really sorry. That wasn't a foregone conclusion, but they brought us in to do a bunch of consultancy for them. We investigated the matter, and it was the wrong solution for them for some very, very real reasons. I'm sorry if this is unpopular, um, but it's true. It was not right for them. So they moved out of it. However, we identified the areas which were right for them, and now their digital uh, infrastructure is all based on open source. They've all gone down the Drupal route. Their document management is all based on Alfresco, and they've got tons and tons of open source in there. We have to, five minutes, okay, we have to be realistic, yeah? Yes, I wanted a, a 5,000 desk Im implementation of OpenOffice as much as you do, but having spent the time in there, weeks and weeks examining all the things it connected to and all the things they couldn't do because of it and people they couldn't talk to, this is prior to the Cabinet Office uh, and the work the Cabinet Office were doing in ODF as well, which, by the way, was informed by the Bristol, Bristol case. It was not the right solution for them, but other areas were. Um, Customers really do know what they want better than we do, so ask. Yeah? Um, in the NHS, we were working with uh, another company, I'm not, not going to name any names, but we were working with, uh, we're still working with another company in there, um, and subcontracting a bunch of the stuff, and this particular company were pressing an uh, analytics product that, that they develop. It's an excellent an analytics project, product, but it was not for this iteration of the project. And the NHS politely said, we don't want to do that. And they were spending hours and hours and hours, days, developing this particular product, which was never going to get a look at. And then ran into trouble later on in the project and said, well, we can't afford to keep doing that. You've been spending all the time on that. You don't want to hear this, <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you, but you've got to stick to exactly what the customer wants, not insert your own event agenda. Finally, the point that I want to get across most of all, and if you take nothing else from my conversation today, take this one away, you are not a technology business, you're a customer service business. If you're in open source, your product is freely available on the internet. They do not need you. You can, and some open source business models are an attempt to lock you in by being the only originator of that code and so on and so forth. Sure, you can play all of those games, but to do open source purely, you cannot lock them into your product. The only, what can you lock them into? Well, the way that you look after them. You are a customer service business, not a technology business. I'm not saying you don't do technology. I'm saying you do customer service better. Open source software doesn't change all of the rules of business. It changes some of them, and primarily about shifting economic power from producers to consumers. That's the primary effect it has out in the business market. Yeah? So the only thing you've got against that economic power is your customer service. Um, you have nothing, nothing to sell. Yeah? Also, I would say to you, it doesn't throw out all of the rules of business. You have to have the other pieces as well. Just because you're an open source company doesn't mean you can ignore 
tried and tr tested sales techniques, tried and tested marketing techniques. You have to do accounting, you have to do HR. Yeah? It doesn't change all of the rules on that. But above all of those, customer service. Train your people. Engineers, I used to be the worst at this, yeah? I used to be extraordinarily geeky. Engineers will naturally want to chat on ILC or on, on email and stuff like that. Train your people to talk face to face, pick up the phone, do customer service trainings, and do human interactions and all, all that kind of stuff. I'm out of time, aren't I? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>